nice. Everyone feel, it feels probably better than they would at 9 a.m. So we'll take that. Um, welcome. We're here to talk about using the RoboTask Runner to improve developer workflows. I'm Mark Dorison. I'm the CTO at Chromatic. Um, Chromatic has been working in the Drupal community for over 15 years. Um, we work with all kinds of clients that have lots of content, um, do lots of complicated migrations, and um, work on sites that have often really um, complicated tooling needs, uh, and that's part of where the motivation for some of this comes from. Um, but hopefully you'll see uh, some inspiration for, you know, when you see some of the examples we go through on ways that you can uh, improve tooling on your sites, even in uh, simple ways. Start out with a warning. Uh, there's going to be a number of code slides, but the good news is that they're purely to show concepts. You don't need to copy anything down. Um, all but a few of the lines that you'll see um, are available in a public repo that we'll mention. Um, and if there's slides where it's clearly a lot of code, just hold your breath for a second, and I'm going to zoom in and uh, you know to specific areas of that. So don't panic. Oh, and also, uh, I'm, we'll definitely have time for Q&A at the end, so if you have questions as we go through, I'm uh, happy to, I'm excited to take questions uh, at the end. So, what's the problem? If you're like me, you like to automate things. Uh, you've worked on a lot of projects that get festooned with bash scripts. They start showing up everywhere. And Bash is great. Lots of people love Bash, but just not for me. It's not my favorite. Um, I use it in situations where I don't have another runtime available. Um, and it's a great fallback. But in my experience, I'd rather work uh, in the primary language of the project. So if we're here at DrupalCon. So if we're talking about a Drupal project written in PHP, I want to write uh, my tasks and scripts in PHP. Um, if it's a JavaScript project, I want to write it in JavaScript. I want whoever the developers are on that project, the language that they're working with, I want them to feel comfortable uh, also working with the tooling and automation pieces as well. So we need a task runner. In this case, we need a PHP task runner. And we're gonna, we're gonna use Robo. So what is Robo? Robo describes itself as a modern and simple PHP task runner inspired by Gulp and Rake aimed to automate common tasks. So you might already be using Robo without even realizing it. If you use this tool, maybe you've heard of it, Drush. Drush is built on top of Robo. Now, Robo was first included in Drush in 2016. It first shipped in Drush 9.0. 9.0 feels like it should have been recent, but it was seven years ago. And Drush 12, I haven't heard Drush 12 is being prepped for release right now. I'm pretty sure. They released it, they released it in their session. They released it in their session yesterday? Yeah. yeah. So Drush 12 is now out. We're on Dr I, I can't believe that we're on Drush 12. It's amazing. Uh, a lot has changed in Drush since 9.0, uh, but Robo's been there for all of that. So the use cases we're going to you know, explore and think about, look at automation, testing, builds and deployments, backups for stores, the list could go on. And what is using Robo going to give us? It's going to give us PHP package access. It's going to give us re better readability in our code, better error handling, and a better developer and user experience. So, you know, when people are running these tools from the command line, it's easier to give them better output, more informative output. So there's a bunch of tools, 
tasks that Robo provides out of the box. So these are things that um, you know, have been sort of wrapped and abstracted. There's file tasks, easily work with files, concatenate, replace. File system tasks, copy directories, things like that, move directories. Working with Composer, you can do uh, work with Composer operations through abstracted into uh, Robo. Things like Composer Update, Composer Validate, we're gonna see some of that in a minute. And you can work with version control systems like Git. So you can perform Git operations via Robo. And last but not, well, not quite least, or not quite last, um, and then there's an exec wrapper, which is sort of a, like, this is your escape hatch. Anything that you can run from the command line, you can run through exec. So if you didn't have, let's say you didn't have a git task and you wanted to work with git, you could just exec, run the exec tasks. So anything that you're doing from the command line, you can do it here. And then now last but not least, uh, it abstracts like parallelization. So if you have specific tasks that are taking a long time, you're working on um, servers that have many processors available, this is fantastic and an easy way to paralyze tasks um, and get great output. And it's a lot, in my experience, much simpler than using like the parallel command on the command line. It abstracts away a lot of the complexity. So how would you set this up, robo generally? Start with Composer Require and a robo file, one file. In that robo file, this is an example of maybe the simplest command that you could create. So the docs are great um, on this uh, as far as all the tasks are concerned. Um, what we see here, um, how does, how does Robo interpret this to determine this is a command? It's a public method. Any public method in your Robo file or a Robo class is gonna be interpreted as a command that you want to expose to the user. If you have helper methods, protected or private methods, those will not be exposed. It's gonna parse the name of that, meth that method into the command name. We'll see that on the next slide. Here we have um, an argument the year, so that's going to be required since there's no default. And then we have the doc block above, which is going to give the help text, and then we've defined an alias. So the main command name is going to be from the hello DrupalCon, and we have an alias of hi. Now when we run robo, just robo like, you know, without this command, we, we want to see the list of commands that robo knows about. This is what we're going to see. So right down at the bottom, we see that there's a hello namespace and hello colon DrupalCon, so that's parsed from the method name. We see hi in brackets, which is our alias, and then we see our help text. And then this is running the command, robo hello DrupalCon. We pass in our argument, 2023, and we see our output. So. This is the simplest implementation. You start putting commands in that robo file. We just saw the simplest command that you could create. But you could imagine that robo file, you start with one command, then you've got five commands, then you've got 10 commands. Some are related, maybe they're in the hello namespace. Now you start having commands that are completely unrelated. You've got many namespaces. So it started on the project I was working on, it started to get a little unwieldy. Uh, I was like, this, this file is a mess. How do I find anything? These things are really not related and we're working with PHP um, and this is not how we would really write a Drupal module. We would be putting things into different classes in their areas of responsibility. So we can do that, auto loading to the rescue. So now we're sort of at an intermediate step. We started with the most simple implementation, just a robo file. But if we tell Composer where we want to store our robo commands in robo slash source, 
we can break them out into separate classes. So here's an example on a project where we've got eight, seven um, different classes that each contain commands that are related to each other. There's nothing special about, you know, this is just how I organize things, but you can organize them the way you want to, but this gives you the ability to do that. So this was our intermediate step. And then we got to the point where we built a lot of great commands and chromatics and agency, we have a lot of different clients, but we wanted to use some of these commands across projects. We wanted to be able to roll out improvements uh, and have those picked up you know, in short order without copying and pasting code um, you know, across these projects. And this was sort of the you know, original, part of the original dream of like, well, why you know, move on from Bash for these things? Um, we wanted to be able to you know, keep things in sync. When we improved one of our deployment uh, commands, we didn't want to have to then keep up with that across all the projects manually. So we wanted to build a package. And we call it our package, Usher. So you can use Usher. Usher's open source. Um, or you can build your own package. Um, but as you saw, since we're using autoloading, we're, you know, we're working in PHP. We can use Composer to pull in a package. Um, so, um, so that's what we did. And on our projects, instead of running require robo, we're going to require usher. So three approaches we just looked at. You could start with a robo file. You could use your commands within the project, break them up into classes. Or you could share commands across projects by putting them into their own, um, own repository and sharing them via packagist or a private package repository. So now we're going to look at a few examples of commands that we've created uh, that will give us hopefully some inspiration for what we could do. So the first one is validating Drupal configuration. So we build every pull request in a preview environment using a tool called Tugboat. Um, shout out to Tugboat. If you don't know the Tugboat folks, um, they're great. And um, Tugboat is also available on Drupal.org. So if you are a maintainer of a contrib project or a heavy uh, contributor to a contributor project, you can enable Tugboat for free on your drupal.org project. All you have to do is add a tugboat config file, um, and it's fantastic. Any merge request that's created for uh, the contrib project, it will get a preview environment built, which is a live site with a database, everything you can click into it and actually test your changes. So this is fantastic for our clients, especially our clients that are less technical. We ask them to review a pull request, and they look at the code, and they're like, sure, no, I don't, thumbs up. Um, but what they really want to see is how that change shows up on the website. And Tugboat lets us do that. So when we build this environment, um, we get to see our full deployment process happen. But we also want to check um, a number of things. But one of them is that the Drupal configuration that's in the database matches what's in disk. So if there's some kind of change that hasn't been exported, um, or some change that fails to import correctly, we want to know about that and not ship it. We want to find out about it before um, we merge that code. So the way we're able to do this, Josh has a command called config status. So we want to run this after we do the deployment, and we want to mark the pull request as failed. So this is what one of our pull requests might look like, and the important bit is right there. In this case, um, the config validation has passed, but if it hasn't, we want to mark that as red. It's a required check, so you'd be unable to merge the pull request if, that has, um, if that's occurred. So what do we need to be able to do this? We're building a preview in Tugboat. We need to run that Drush command, that operation with the right, um, with the right arguments, the right options. And then we need to talk to the GitHub API to mark, um, mark this specific check as pass or fail. 
So this is what the bash script looked like before I started. And this is actually um, like a, a intermediate uh, step because if you look down at the bottom, there actually, this actually is running a robo command. And don't worry, you don't really need to read all this. But, um, but what you do need to know is that all this, all this was just the piece to talk to the GitHub API. We're escaping strings, we're calling out to curl, it's gross. Um, and the, the moment that I opened this file and approached it was the moment when this was working for one check uh, like this, but I wanted to implement it for a second check. And to do that easily, at least my level of bash expertise, I was going to, you know, I was looking at them like, I'm gonna need to copy and paste this into another bash command for that separate command. And that was a huge red flag to me. That was the moment when I was like, okay, I've put this off long enough. This is the moment where we're gonna put this into PHP, into, into Robo, into Usher, in fact. So this is where it started. So we have our class, the validate config commands. Uh, there's a trait, the GitHub status trait, more on that in a minute. That has all the logic for um, setting the GitHub status. And this is part of what we get by working in PHP. We can use, uh, we can use tools like traits to abstract that logic and then use it across a number of different classes. I told you I wanted to reuse it. So we got that and then we've got constants um, so we can do things nicely like that. And Another benefit to working in PHP for this stuff is now you get all the benefits of static analysis. So if you're running PHP stand on your code, um, you know, it's gonna catch things. Hey, you said you were returning a string from this method and you could potentially be returning something else. It'll, it'll fail that if you're running. So things like that that you're not getting um, with your bash scripts. Catch a lot of issues before we ship them with tooling like that. So, now we have our command that Robo is going to expose. Now you can see that the doc block is a little more uh, full featured than the one we looked at before. Um, but the important bits to, to point out are you see the, that we have a public function and the name validate Drupal config. We've got um, a site direct siters um, argument that has a default. And then we have an options array, which is our flags for the command. And we've documented all that above, so that, that's up top in the doc block is what Robo interprets, along with our alias. Um, but we also get to use things in PHP, like I mentioned, like we have a return type on the method, um, and we go from there. So now, now we're actually looking at the trait. Now this is where we're gonna look at the code that actually replaced uh, that big piece of bash. So we've abstracted out the setting of GitHub status. Um, you can see that we're giving some user feedback using the yell uh, and the say uh, commands that are built into Robo. Um, but we're able to break these into uh, separate methods as well. Again, great for static analysis. So. Um, if we're suddenly introducing a typo, you know, that's gonna show up if we're calling a method that doesn't exist. Um, that's gonna show up. And then here we have our method that actually talks to uh, the API. And in this slide, we see that we're setting everything up. We're using environment variables to get the appropriate data. We're setting the URL that we're gonna to call to and then setting the body of the request. And then we get to use Guzzle to make the request instead of curl. Um, so this is an example of how we're able to rely on other PHP packages um, and require them with Composer, pull them in and make use of those instead of making some assumptions about what's installed on the system or what might not be in the case of Bash. So we're making that request, it's a post, passing in the body and the headers, and then we're handling the exception if one occurs. 
And that's how we set that value on the PR. So this is a bit of a different example. Um, this one is an example I think that seems kind of potentially too easy at first, but built up over time. Um, and I found it to be something that we ran into the real world. So um, for us, we've ended up with a lot of YAML configuration for different environments on our site. So we use Lando um, often for local development environments, maybe use Lando or DDEV or Doxel. Um, so you, in there, along with a lot of other configuration, you're often gonna have a, a string with your PHP version. Same thing on Tugboat, which we talked about before. Somewhere in there, sometimes multiple places, you're going to have your PHP version. GitHub workflows, where we run all of our uh, GitHub Actions workflows, where we run a lot of our um, tests that don't need a database. Things that need a bit database, we run in Tugboat. But um, other stuff, we run in GitHub Actions. And uh, same for production hosting. If you use a platform as a service, like Pantheon or platform.sh, you've got a YAML configuration with a PHP version string in there. So we found that over time, when we it came time to upgrade PHP, someone would go through and create a PR with those changes. They'd change 7.4 to 8.0 and open up a PR. And maybe they'd ask for me to review the PR, and I'd look at it and say, hey, you've changed four files. All the strings went from 7.4 to 8.0. That looks good to me. And all the tests pass. Give it a thumbs up. But then there'd be like, oh, wait, there was one we missed. I can't review something that's not in the PR. And I mean, it would be if I was, uh, if I never made any mistakes, maybe I would remember, wait, there should be six files that are changed, but there's only five. Um, but that's not me. So, uh, so I missed it. And it goes out. And then maybe weeks later, we find out, oh, we've been running. We're on 8.0 in all these places, but and we think we're on 8.0 everywhere. But really, we're still on 7.4 in this one environment. We didn't know that. So I created a command that's going to handle all of that for us. Don't read this. This is the entire command. A fair bit of this code is user feedback to the, um, to the command line. So let me pull that out. So this is the meat of the command without the user feedback, which the user feedback is very valuable. Don't get me wrong, but just for this discussion today, we're going to look at this part. So these are the pieces. Up at the top, we see the uh, function signature. Config update PHP version is our command name. We have a required argument version, which is a string. And then we have one flag for skip composer update. I should add one thing. One of the ways, the important concepts about how we're able to share these commands across projects effectively is configuration YAML. So um, there's a robo.yaml file that you can create and put any kind of configuration you want in it. So what we do is write our commands with the idea in mind that this is going to be shared across a bunch of sites. And any of the pieces that could be different um, that we would otherwise maybe hard code, we set those as values in that configuration YAML. So here, we're going to that configuration YAML, and we're getting the current PHP version. So we've told it the version that we want when we call our command. So in this example, I think we're going to upgrade to 8.1. And so we're looking for the current PHP version. Maybe it's 7.4. Next up, we're going to load the files that we want to check. We're not going to do a find and replace over the entire uh, code base. There are probably places in the code base where the string 7.4 exists in contexts that are not about PHP. Uh, I checked. Uh, believe it or not, it shows up in a lot of uh, like SAS files or, uh, and things like that. So we don't want to do that. So we want to limit our problem space. So we have on a per project basis, developers in the project can say, what are the files 
that this type of configuration is stored in. So if you have one project that uses platform.sh, you can list those type of files. Uh, if you have another project that uses Pantheon, you can list those files at, in that configuration array. Same thing for if you use Lando or DDEV, those are gonna be in different places. So we're gonna load the configuration that we, can ch that we wanna check. Same thing with a readme, maybe, you want to, maybe it's mentioned in your readme. These are the places that I forget to check when we make those changes. So that's what that looks like in the configuration YAML. So we've got our PHP current version, 8.1, so we're starting there. And then our pads that we want to check, Composer, Lando, Tugboat, Platform, GitHub Workflow, and the readme. And then we're gonna replace our version strings. Robo makes this very simple. This is one of those tasks that I mentioned at the beginning, replace in file. You give it the from and the to, and you run it. If composer.json is in that array of files, we also wanna make sure that our lock file is valid. So, if you didn't tell it to skip this step, which we provided as an option to the user, they can choose to skip this. Um, again, something that working in PHP makes very straightforward. I don't know how I would write this in Bash. Somebody here probably does, but I don't. We can skip that easily. But, because we didn't skip it, we're going to run a composer update with the lock option, which is gonna make sure that we don't update any of our um, dependencies. We're telling it which directory that, we're, that we want this command to run in. So composer update dash dash lock in, in a certain directory, that's what's gonna happen with this. And then the last line, we run composer validate to make sure that it comes back as green and valid. And this is what it looks like when you run it. So the current PHP version is 8.1. We've specified 8.2 is the version we want to move to. It checks composer.json. In this case, I did tell it to skip composer validate just to limit the output for the slide. And then we can see all the other uh, places that, that um, where we replaced this. So now in our documentation, we can tell the developers on that project when you when it comes time to update PHP version, all you have to do is run this one command. You don't have to remember all the different places. You don't have to rely on a list that may or may not have been updated. Now it does rely on the config YAML. So you know if we start adding places where that string is, we'd need to update that. But this gives the opportunity for more developers on the project to feel confident in doing these types of operations. And this is what it looks like if it doesn't go well. So if we were able to easily check, again, easily in PHP, hey, did, is where we're at with the current version the same as the version you've specified? We're gonna give some, um, some nice output to make it really clear why we're why the command is failing. So third example, um, one of our projects is a Drupal 9, soon to be Drupal 10 um, code base that runs many different sites. Um, in, I think it's, it's north of 20 now and growing. Um, and essentially at the code base level, it's a multi-site. It doesn't run that way in production. Every, all the production sites are completely siloed on their own infrastructure. But when we're creating things locally, that's how we you know, tell Drupal what's going on. So when we add a new site, there's a lot of files and directories that need to be created and updated. Some of those were files that we mentioned earlier, like those YAML files, but also Drupal settings files. Um, and we started with documentation, and our readme is quite large on this, on this project. 
Um, so again, this is a place where um, the README is great and valuable, and our doc we want our documentation to be great, but the documentation can get stale, too, and it's kind of hard to test documentation. If we created a command that would do these steps, then we could actually run this command in our CI environments and make sure that it executes successfully. So this command, we're going to update our Lando config, update Tugboat config, GitHub workflows, <coughs> update Drupal sites configuration. Um, with the latest versions of this command, we even um, you know, do things like create keys for um, two-factor authentication. Um, so again, that's stuff that started as in the readme, a bunch of commands for a developer to run locally. You know, run this command, take the output, put it in a file, move the file to this path. Um, but now we can do that with a command and allow more developers to feel confident in this type of process. We've got error checking. We've got our steps that I just highlighted, you know, calling out to helper methods, Lando config, sites files, uh, tugboat config, GitHub workflows, um, and tests, and settings files. So it's running all of, this is kind of an Uber command that runs a bunch of um, other operations. So the one that I'm gonna call out and show is that tugboat config file. So we talked about tugboat before. So here's our helper method. This is a protected method, so it is not being exposed as a robo command on its own. But as you saw two slides ago, we're calling it from our command. Um, here we get to work with Drupal's built-in YAML class. So we don't need to deal just with um, that file as a, as a string. Uh, what we can do is load it and decode it, and that's going to put it into an array for us that we can work with in PHP. And then here we're essentially editing that YAML, but right now it's an array. We're going to create new items with the site name that we passed in. We're going to add commands um, at the right place in the MariaDB container and the init method. We had a um, create database command. And then we're going to write it back to disk and give some user output. So this is what, again, there's a, I took a few things out to make it fit slightly better on this slide. But just to give you a sense of the, the number of things that this command is doing. And I would emphasize, too, this isn't where we started. You know, we started with it doing one thing or two things. And then it grew over time because it was effective and people were getting value out of it. So here, we run a command at the top, site create Drupal association, production URI, we pass that in, and then it runs the scaffold command, updates the config files. Another great thing with Robo, easy to ask for user input, so you can say, hey, do you want to do X or do you, yes or no? In this case, we said no, so that changed what was being written into some of our config files. Um, Making, making, creating directories, moving files around. Um, down at the bottom, we move our example settings.php uh, file into the right location that now exists, and we do some string replacement with the site name so it has the right values. And then um, we even create some uh, two-factor keys, as I mentioned, uh, and put those in the right place. And then give more user output for like what the next steps are. Hey, you can now run a create theme command after this, uh, and it'll do similar type operations to create the sub-theme for this. So we've used Robo to create, to replace bash scripts. We, I showed how we can, um, we started with a Robo file and then moved the Robo file into classes, so you know, we can benefit from some of the organizational benefits of working in PHP. 
We talked about how you could share these commands across projects if you have a lot of projects or even just more than one project where you'd like to share some of uh, this functionality. And then we looked at examples for config validation, PHP version changes, and uh, site creation. This is just a little bit of uh, promotion. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on with Drupal 7 end of life. If you know anyone, if you or you know anyone that still is responsible for Drupal 7 sites, uh, we've been talking about all the implications of that on the Drupal 7 end of life podcast. Um, it's been, we've had some really interesting interviews with Tim Lennon, Matt Glamman, who just released a tool uh, this week that will allow you to run Drupal 7 modules in Drupal 10. Um, and the idea behind that being to ease the transition. We know it's a big burden to move from Drupal 7 to Drupal, to modern Drupal 9, 10. Um, and this will help that transition with the idea of being like, if we can cut that lift by 40%, that's gonna make a big difference for organizations that have a lot of complex code. Um, so that he released yesterday, another uh, Drupal Con release, so that's pretty cool. I have stickers here for this if anyone's interested, but check it out. And that's it, thank you all very much. If I, if I don't remember to repeat the question, please remind me. Yes. Yeah, sure. That's, that's easy, I can do that. <laughs> You've mentioned that you created the uh, share package mm -hmm. where you share common tasks among all the projects, right? Yeah. And then you have the configuration files, for example. Uh, the files that you have, PHP versions, that needs to be updated, right? And that configuration file will be in the uh, share package. No. That file... Repeat the question, please. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I know. Thank you very much. So, uh, the gentleman asked for um, the Usher package contains a number of commands that are you know, able to be pulled into downstream projects. You asked the configuration file that lists things out like the PHP version or the array of files that, that we want to operate on. He asked if that file also lives in the Usher package. Uh, the simple version, the simple answer to your question is no, that file lives on the individual projects. So, you know, let's say you have 10 sites, 10 projects that want to use Usher. Each one of those has a robo uh, YAML configuration file so that you can configure those commands to run differently on each one. So one site might be on PHP 7.4 currently and so, and you know, and has a certain set of YAML files that you want to work with. Another site might already be on 8.1 or 8.2, and so those files will differ site to site. The slightly more complicated answer to your question is all of what I just said, and Robo has its own one because, or Usher has its own configuration file because sometimes some of these commands will run, we want them to run on that package too, so we use Usher to work on Usher in addition to working on on these other projects. Does that make sense? And, yeah, yeah, so in the end, you need to have those configurations. You will end up needing to copy or manually create those configurations in that project. Yeah, it depends on the command. So some commands, uh, I'm, I, I, I don't have an example off the top of my head, but some commands maybe you don't need uh, anything in the configuration file and it'll, you know, you, and you require Usher and then um, you you run robo, it'll list out the commands, you see the commands and you just run it. Other commands that need some configuration, like the PHP version one's a simple example. If you require usher and run that command without setting up the configuration YAML, the command will fa fail. It'll say, I don't know what your current PHP version is, I looked in this uh, config file and it wasn't there. So then you say, oh, I forgot to do that step, let me create the config file. Um, and in Usher, I'm pretty confident it's up to date. We have like an example um, robo.yaml configuration that has sample values for those that you would then copy into your project. Great question, thank you. What else, yeah? So all of this is, thank you greatly. This is value You're welcome. I can't wait to start applying some of this, but um, any pain points in, in this that you might feel against the tips on? 
Um, well, one recent one um, was that I started writing a command to work with something with our integration tests. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the question was, um, have we hit any pain points um, in working in this way? An example of a pain point would be I started writing a command to work with our integration tests. Um, about halfway through, I was, I was showing it to a colleague, and he reminded me that our integration tests run in a container that does not have PHP uh, in it. It's, uh, it, it runs in Java, it has JavaScript runtime, Node.js. So I was like, oh, well, it's got the whole repo there. You know, the whole re repository is checked out in that container, but I actually don't have PHP installed. So at that point, I alluded to this earlier, like, well, we could use Bash. That would, you know, that's available many more places, and in that case, it would probably be there. Um, or in that case, it would be like, well, we could use um, a JavaScript um, task runner. Uh, and there was already some precedent for that on the project, so that's what I ended up doing. So that is the one thing you'd have to be, especially on projects where, which is not uncommon on Drupal projects, we have a whole front end ecosystem that there's a lot of JavaScript. If you're breaking that up into places, you know, with containers that where PHP is not always present, you know, that's something you should watch out for. You're welcome. What else? One more? Anybody? Last call? All right. Thank you all very much. <laughs>